Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Jerusalem, Israel, and we continue with Pirkei Derabi Eliezer. We are currently in chapter 47. This is 47C, and this one is called Criminal. Now, if you're just joining us for the first time in between uh, Calling All Jews, uh, that series, so we're in Pirkei Derby Eliezer, we are going through the entire Torah, Torah Nevim Ketuvim, uh, prophecies, we're going through the four levels of Torah over there, we're learning about Jewish law, everything is integrated and you get a much better um, understanding of everything that you would be reading. So we're right now we're currently on the topic of sexual immorality and the story of what happened with Pinchas, and we'll see other, other examples of this taken throughout the Torah and also the inevitable outcome. So we're going to pick up right where we left off last week, sexual immorality and the slippery slope that follows. Shimon and Levi were zealous regarding sexual immorality or fornication, as said in Genesis thirty-four thirty-one, And they said, Shall he make our sister like a harlot? Vayomu hakazona yaset achotenu. Zona is prostitute, right? And the chieftain of the tribe of Shimon forgot that his what his elder had done. The chieftain of the tribe of Shimon. We understand the story of Pinchas. So the chieftain of the tribe of Shimon forgot what Shimon, his elder, Shimon himself, did from earlier in the chapter. Now, it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain, we're talking about the city of Shechem, that Jacob's two sons, Shimon and Levi, Dina's brothers, each took a sword and they came upon the city with confidence and they slew every male. And Chamol and his son Shechem, they slew with the edge of the sword, and they took Dina out and out of Shechem's house, and they left. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and plundered that city that had defiled their sister, their flocks and their cattle and their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and whatever was in the field they took, and all their wealth and all their infants and their wives they captured and plundered, and all that was in the house." I don't recall where it is. I, either it was in the, the Parsha teachings about this or we did this on the, the Zoom group. But there's a very, specific, uh, a very specific reason why they did this to the entire city when supposedly just one family sinned, okay? The long and the short of it is that the entire city was complicit. They knew exactly what was going on. They covered for them, so they were all responsible. Kind of like, you know... Today's conflicts. Anyway, the children of Jacob do not mess around when it comes to harlotry, debauchery, and sexual immorality. You rape our daughter, our sister. This is what you get. Today, we'll just send you humanitarian aid. I honestly don't know what's worse, but in any case, and the chieftain of the tribe of Shimon forgot what his elder Shimon had done. And he did not rebuke the young men of Israel. <clears throat> Rather, he himself publicly came upon the Midianite woman in harlotry. As said in Numbers 25, 14, the name of the Israelite man who was killed, who was slain with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, the chieftain of the Shimonite paternal house. Our commentators specifically mention the standing of this individual because he goes by another name, and that is Shlumiel ben Suri Shaddai. He is mentioned five times throughout the Torah, all five in the book of Numbers between chapters 1 and 10. He was mentioned by name in the very beginning of the book when God commanded Moses to take a census of his most coveted treasure his firstborn son, Israel. Numbers 1.6, for Shimon Shlumiel ben Tzuri Shaddai. There he is right there with a different name. The man that would go to commit these horrible public acts before all of Israel was none other than the number one guy in the tribe of Shimon. Not a chieftain, the actual commander-in-chief. It says Nasile Beit Av. That's also, he's got all the... Um, He's got all the titles over here. That's how, that's how important the Torah wants us to know that he was. We will understand shortly the gravity of the situation he created. Now we have discussed this entire topic before and some parts may overlap, but this is to give you yet another understanding of the depths of Torah. Chapter 25 in Numbers starts like this. 
Israel settled in Shittim. Remember what we discussed a few weeks ago? Wherever it says where Israel sat, not settled, Yashvu, trouble always followed, and we gave different examples throughout the Torah. Vayeshev Israel Bashitim. Israel sat in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of the Moabites. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and prostrated themselves to their gods. Israel became attached to Baal Peor. We also discussed that. And the anger of the Lord flared against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, take all leaders of the people and hang them before the Lord facing the sun, and then the flaring anger of the Lord will be removed from Israel. Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you shall kill the men who became attached to Baal Peor. By the way, this, and again, this is something that I recently learned because when you learn the same thing over and over and over again, it's not like you're learning the same thing. You're going through more and more. You're getting deeper and new perspectives, new commentary. Turns out that this did not actually happen. Right as Moses gave the command, that's when this whole story of uh, of um, uh, Zimri and Cosby came into play. In other words, they were not even able to exact justice and judgment upon the perpetrators to begin with. Okay, so that that's what happened over here. They were supposed to do this, and that was going to stop everything. But then that came about. And it's like, oh no, now what? So already the protective shield of Israel was shattered, as we discussed even in the Parsha teachings, uh, Iron Dome, I believe it's called. And that is only something that can be done from within, as it was. Already, Chaon Af, the angel of destruction, was on the loose to destroy Israel. And with everything that Moses, Elazar, and the rest of the elders of Israel did to put off the destruction of Israel, God gave them the solution for atonement. Okay, take the perps, put them up hang him over there, and each one is going to kill his fellow because of what they did to you, essentially. And then it was on its way to being over, or so they thought. Then this happened. Next verse. Then an Israelite man came and brought the Midianite woman to his brethren before the eyes of Moses and before the eyes of the entire congregation of the children of Israel, while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So they didn't even have the time to exact this just, uh, justice. So notice in here, in the verse we just read, it doesn't have his name over here, but rather an Israelite man. Why is that? Because he single-handedly almost destroyed all of Israel and thereby the world. And so naturally, his name would be blotted out of the Torah, meaning from existence, because for what he did, there was no redemption. The worst thing the worst thing that a person can do is cause others to sin. That is absolutely the worst thing that you can do. So not only are you going to pay for your sin, you're going to pay for their sins. And they will also pay for their sins because of you. You see, whether you uh, deceive them or not is irrelevant. They're still going to fall. And that's why your punishment is so great. So they sin and you sin. Them by accident, you on purpose. It's a big no-no. Okay, so all this happened. There was no redemption for him until Pinchas came along, literally saving the day. And that is how we know that the, uh, that's how we knew the name of the perpetrator, essentially. Meaning that through this act, Zimri ben Salu was redeemed and his name returned to the Torah. Again, God doesn't want to see any of his kids be cut off where it says, and that nefesh will be cut off from its people, that means you no longer partake in the lot of Israel. You are cut off. That is a terrible thing. However, and this is called karet. Karet literally means to lichrot, to cut off. However, if you do tshuva, there's always a redemption, even for something like this. And there was, and we're going to see what it was. It's not just like, say you're sorry. Some things had to be done exactly in the right moment, in the right time, by the right man. Okay. <clears throat> so, like we said, meaning um, that through this act, Zimri ben Salu was redeemed and his name returned to the Torah. Now, let's continue. And all the princes and Moses, Elazar and Pinchas, saw the angel of death. What did they see? Did they actually, literally see the angel of death himself? The Satan? No, they did not. They saw one of his extensions, as mentioned a few classes ago when we covered this, right? The five angels of destruction, sometimes four, sometimes six. The angels of destruction, they're an extension of Satan. Satan, who does Satan answer to? Satan answers to the angel Gabriel. 
Gabriel is the archangel of destruction. Who does Gabriel answer to? God. God says, okay, it's that guy's time. It goes down the chain and they are sent out. Angels are not independent agents, okay? They cannot do what they, they don't have free reign to do what they want. They do have free will because in certain places you can also learn even angels have punishments. They don't go directly. They don't defy God, obviously, because they know God. We discussed this plenty of times. All right, anyway, let's continue. What they saw was Israel were dropping dead by the thousands. This is what they saw, as we read in Numbers 25.9. Those that died in the plague numbered 24,000. And the name of the perpetrator was Chema, the most powerful of the five angels of destruction. So Moses and Eleazar, Pinchas, and the elders, they saw they saw Israel dropping by the thousands. This is Chaon Af, right? And then afterwards, and so it says that they, they saw the Satan. They saw his extensions. That, that was Chalonaf, and now, that was before, and now they saw Chemalev, and they're like, uh-oh, how are we taking this one back? And I discussed exactly how to do this, and that's what he did. Numbers 25, 10 to 11. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, a Kohen, has turned my anger away from the children of Israel by his zealousy, avenging me among them, so that I did not destroy the children of Israel because of my zeal. You lose that in the English. Let's read the Hebrew. He returned my chema. That is the name of this angel of destruction. Okay? Returned my chema. And they would sit and weep, for they did not know what to do at that moment. Picture this. Moses, the holiest man and most refined human being to have ever lived, is with the high priest Eleazar, son of his brother Aaron, his nephew, and the princes of the tribes of Israel, and also the, the elders, the Sanhedrin, they all just finished praying for salvation from the previous sin that the tribe of Shimon had committed. These men are pious, holy, and humble, and of course, modest. They never looked upon a married woman's hair. This is how I forgot the guy's name right now. Sometimes it'll lose me. But um, in the... the um, Korach Rebellion, one of the main guys from the tribe of Reuven did not go because his wife saved him. How did she save him? She saw, dude, you're going against Moses and Aaron. Don't you see what God did to, uh, did for us? Don't you see that this guy is doing what God says? And he's like, yeah, but he got, you know, peer pressure and everything. She's like, okay. She gave him wine. He went to sleep instead of going to the meeting with Korach and the rest of the dudes. She stood in front of her tent when they came removed her hair covering. As a married woman, you don't do that in public. And she started brushing her hair. These guys who were with Korach's camp, though they, again, will say rebelled against God, they still kept halacha. They're like, we, they couldn't look at it. Like, okay, we'll come back later. They came back later. She was there again. What's up, boys? No. So you have to understand, and these are the perpetrators, how humble Israel were back in the day. There was no such thing as walking around half naked, right? Or even a little naked, or even slightly exposed at the time, as the Shekhinah was among them. These are halachot specifically. <clears throat> Modesty is a very big thing in Judaism. And now, all of a sudden, Zimri, one of the most powerful and influential men in Israel, <clears throat> who has been mentioned by name a number of times in the five books of Moses, grabs the princess of Midian by the hair, she was the daughter of Balak, by the way, that's hence the princess, and brings her before the council. When she came, when she first came to Israel, because again, based on uh, Bilam's um, uh, suggestions, okay, listen, you can't take them out from the outside, but you can break them from the inside. How? Send your girls to go do their harlotry around Israel and the, the boys will start coming out. So that's exactly what happened. Still is happening today. So when she came to Israel, the king sent his own daughter to be a harlot. You see, she was looking for Moses, the leader. And she said, I'm a princess. Surely I need the king. Who is your ruler? While Zimri said, Moses is but from the tribe of Levi. I am the chieftain of the tribe of Shimon. Shimon is the elder of Levi. And so I am the guy who you are looking for. So he grabs her by the hair, drags her like a caveman to Moses and the council when they are both completely naked. 
That's right. They begin to mess around in public in front of them, in front of the holy eyes of Moses, while a ruckus was surrounding them. This is where he asked Moses this question. Tell me, cousin, is this Midianite woman kosher for me or not? What's the halacha? You know those people when they ask these questions, oh yeah, so that? I don't mess with those because clearly they're not looking for answers. Good for you. Talk. Knowing full well that Moses' own wife was a Midianite. You see how that works? Why he did what he did? It wasn't to receive an answer. From the shock of the debauchery, Moses could not answer. From the impure sight his knowledge had left him, he was speechless. If Moses would have answered, he would have said, of course she is not allowed for you. And if they were to ask him about his own wife, the answer is that Zipporah converted, and she was a kosher and holy woman, otherwise Moses would not have been with her. I'll give you an example you probably didn't know about, but this is from the book of Jasher. I highly recommend you guys read it. It gives you incredible backstory, Midrash, for the entire five books of Moses from the from Adam up until the death of Joshua. It fills in a lot of the blanks. Excellent stuff. Moses was the king of Cush for 40 years. 40 years. Remember, Moses left Egypt when he was 20, and then all of a sudden we see him when he's 80. What happened during those 60 years? For 40 of those years, he was king of Cush. For 10 of those years, he was a prisoner uh, by his father-in-law, Jethro. Again, it's all written there. Okay, so the previous king had died of Cush, and Moses was a war hero. You know, he was, five, says he was five meters tall, very tall, um, very two and a half meters, excuse me, very good looking, very wise. You know, he was radiating holiness, good stuff. So they gave him the queen and placed him over them as king. Now I'm going to read from Jasher. <clears throat> and they placed the royal crown upon his head. I'm not going to read everything, just the relevant verses. And they placed the royal crown upon his head, and they gave him for a wife, Adonia, the Cushite queen, wife of Kikanus. Kikianus. Kikianus. And Moses feared the Lord God of his fathers, so that he came not to her, nor did he turn his eyes to her. For Moses remembered how Abraham had made his servant Eliezer swear, saying unto him, You shall not take a woman from the daughters of Canaan for my son Isaac. Straight up. Therefore Moses had turned not his heart nor his eyes to the wife of Kikianus all the days that he reigned over Cush. And in the 40th year, 40th, here's at the end of his reign, 40th year of the reign of Moses over Cush, Moses was sitting on the royal throne whilst Adonia the queen was before him and all the nobles were sitting around him. And Adonia the queen said before the king and the princes, what is this thing which you, the children of Cush, have done for this long time? Surely you know that for 40 years that this man has reigned over Cush, he has not approached me, nor has he served the gods of the children of Cush. He stayed true. Now therefore, hear, O ye children of Cush, and let this man no more reign over you, as he is not of our flesh. This is truth. So for 40 years, Moses was married to the queen, and she is the one even that states that he did not lay a finger on her, nor did he ever look upon her. Meaning, they weren't even in the same living quarters. Okay? You do not question the integrity of Moses. So back to our story. Do to the public, immodest, sexual, debaucherous, uh, debaucheries, Moses, Eleazar, and the princes and the chieftains of the tribes of Israel, they all lost it for a sec, right? This is kind of a distraction. What is going on? Oh my God, what is happening right now? And then you ask a halacha question. Like, are you serious? What, I'm supposed to look at you and answer the halacha question? Look what you're doing right now. Okay, so meaning they forgot the halacha, which is, of course you cannot have her. She is not kosher. To which Zimri was like, gotcha, when he proceeded to drag Cosby back to his tent in the center of the tribe of Shimon and continued to do the deed, surrounded by his tribesmen. But Pinchas, Pinchas did not forget, and furthermore, the shock perhaps didn't hit him as hard because Zimri made it personal towards Moses. All these attacks from individuals from Israel 
especially those that caused Israel to go astray. It was not the majority of Israel. It was certain uh, powerful individuals. And look at their positions. Not lowly individuals. You have Datan and Aviram. They were chieftains of their own tribes. Then you had Korach. Then you have Zimri. Chieftains, right? The 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 high, the the very uh, well spoken, wealthy, well educated. They're the ones that came after Moses. So if, aside from the fact that Moses was the only one who could answer this halacha question, see, there is a law that when a halacha question is being asked in the presence of a rabbi, let's say a rabbi sitting there with a bunch of students, someone comes in and asks generally the question halacha, right? If any of the students dare answer before their rabbi, the penalty is death. This today obviously doesn't hold. There's no Sanhedrin. And again, it was it was not that I'm aware of. This was never recorded that this ever happened. These 2,000 years ago were not the same people as, they, as we are today. Okay? So again, if, but today, if someone asks your rabbi a question in your presence, don't you dare open your mouth. Your rabbi asks unless he says, please. Let so-and-so answer that question. And so Pinchas saw that Zimri publicly took the Midianite, and he was moved by great zeal. He saw that Moses wasn't answering. He saw that his own father wasn't answering. He saw that all the elders were not answering. He was this, the littlest guy there, right? How can So how can our text say this? Simply because of his next act. In other words, talk is cheap. Show me the money. He didn't talk. He acted. And for him to do what he did, coming after the prince of the tribe of Shimon and the daughter of Balak, inside the heart of that tribe, shows that he had no regard for his own life. In certain Midrashim, it says that, in fact, he died there, that his, his nephesh actually left him. And then when it came back, it came back with the souls of uh, Nadav and Avihu, his, uh, his uncles? Also, the brothers of, yeah, his uncles, the brothers of, of Elazar, who died at, in the Mishkan. So he received their souls as well because they were also righteous. And that's how he, he started building up his whole Elijah entourage, if you will. So he turned his brain off because if he would have thought about it, he might not have done it. He just saw, this is wrong, I'm doing it. End of story. Not even thinking I'm doing it, just this is wrong action reaction but he knew right from wrong and he waited to see what his rabbi Moses would do first and what his father Eleazar would do and what the elders of Israel would do because like we said he was the youngest the smallest the most insignificant of them all until now he wasn't even anointed as a priest at the time we discussed this this is why God said now he is he is a priest to me I'm giving him briti shalom my covenant to peace he was only anointed for battle, which means he was actually allowed to do what he did. Because peace, uh, priests are not allowed to draw blood, not allowed to go to war. So he took the proper steps. He did things correctly according to the laws of God, which Moses had taught him. And when all was said and done, he acted according to the teachings of our sages as, de as derived directly from the law of Moses. Mishnah Avot 2.5 In a place where there are no men strive to be a man. Remember this, okay? When you're looking around you and there are yes, there are there are people, there are males. Just because that, you know, it doesn't mean you're it doesn't make you a man. A man always does the right thing, makes the hard choices. This is what we are tasked to do and usually the right thing to do is the hard choice. And so if you're the only one there, then be the only one there. You can redeem everybody if you just do the right thing. Meaning, when nothing else is being done, stand up and do it yourself. So what did he do? <clears throat> he grabbed the halberd from the hand of Moses. The word in Hebrew for halberd is romach. So it says romach. This is not a spear, which is chanit. As we know, Moses did not, go, did not walk around with the halberd. And it's also forbidden to walk into a place of study with weapons of war. If there's a Beit Midrash, you leave all your swords and spears and all that stuff outside. And they were sitting at the entrance of the tent of meeting. There are no weapons over there. So Pinchas perhaps grabbed the staff from Moses' hand, or again, likely he didn't grab Moses' stand. In other words, he took control from Moses and he went and he did what he did. 
as he was walking towards the perpetrators, then he grabbed the halberd, because I also understood this from another Midrash, he actually put it together while he was walking, and in even another Midrash, he took the um, <clears throat> he took the, uh, the the pointy end, and he put it in his garment, just walking with the staff, and when he finally entered into the tent of uh, the chieftain of the tribe of uh, Shimon, that's when he assembled it, and that's when he shish them. Because before that, it was being guarded, right? And so the rest of the tribesmen were saying, what are you doing here, Levite? You know, you don't belong here. You coming to cause trouble. We just saw you sitting up there with your daddy and Moses. What's going on? He goes, no, I actually want to get in on the action. They're like, oh, really? Okay, let him in. And he went in and that's when he did it. Okay, so <clears throat> if you think that all this by him doing this was disrespectful for Moses because Moses didn't do it, then please think again. Who comes first always? Who's number one? Number one. Number one. God. Always. And it was God's honor that was being trampled upon over here. And so we do not consider anyone else's honor, including one's rabbi, before God. And it was indeed confirmed by God himself that he did good, right? God blessed him, gave him an eternal covenant, eternal life right then and there. In other words, he did good. He saved Israel from destruction, giving no mind to anyone else, but still waiting for his rabbi to answer or not answer. When that wasn't done, he went and he did what he had to do. So we're going to read through the next chunk and we'll explain, okay? So this is, again, this is from Pirkei de Revelezer. He ran after them, and while they were in the act, while they were in the middle, he stabbed them. The man threw his brit from behind him. Just, again, I wouldn't, you know, you can't really draw a depiction of this, but basically, male, female, okay, the man was on top. He stabbed the man from behind right through his brit, his covenant, his circumcision, and it went all the way through to the woman's stomach, okay? So, did that. Therefore, the Holy One, blessed be he, gave him to eat from the stomach, keva. What are we talking about here? The priests are given specific tithes to eat from the offerings of the children of Israel. Each corresponds to an action that Pinchas performed and a miracle that God performed. Let's keep reading. And he, Pinchas, flexes his arms, right? To, he had to hold them up and stood the halberd in the ground and they, man and woman, were stayed at the top of it, one on top of the other, the man on top, and the woman on the bottom. That doesn't make sense. If the man is on, on the top and the woman is on the bottom, and he stabs them right through, and he should lift them up, so the woman should be on the top and the man should be on the bottom. We already discussed this a, a while back, that there were 10, 11, or even 12 miracles, some say even 20 miracles that took place during all of this. <clears throat> but in this text, we're just gonna discuss we're gonna discuss a few of them. The staff didn't break from the weight. They did not slide down, though they were impaled. And Pinchas was given super strength to hold them up the way he did. Another one is that no blood came out because if blood falls on a priest, then he's not kosher for the priesthood anymore, right? Also, they remained alive because you a priest cannot be around a dead person. So all God did all these things to make sure, in other words, to show that what he was doing was correct. And of course, an angel came and said, and he flipped the bodies around so that Zimri was on top and Cosby was on the bottom, though they were stabbed in a way that it should have been the opposite. And the jaw of the male were separated from the jaws of the female, and so the Holy One, blessed be he, gave Pinchas food for life, as said in Deuteronomy 18.3, and this shall be the Kohanim's due from the people, from those who perform a slaughter, be it an ox or a sheep, he shall give the Kohen the foreleg, the jaws, and the stomach. The foreleg, the jaws, and the stomach. These are the three things mentioned in this section. Now look what it says in Masechet Chulin 134b. <coughs> the commentators of the Torah uh, Dolshe uh, Hamurot would say, meaning our commentators, with regard to the reason why the foreleg, the jaw, and the belly were given to the priests, the foreleg corresponds to the hands of Pinchas, right? He had to strengthen his hands, hold it up. Son of Elazar the priest, who killed Zimri, some son of Salu, thereby bringing an end to the plague that was ravaging the children of Israel. 
as it says in Numbers 25, 7, and it likewise states in the verse, and he took a halberd in his hand. So this is when that all began. And the jaw corresponds to the prayer, tefillah, offered by Pinchas during the aforementioned incident. And so it states in Psalms 106, 30, Pinchas stood up and executed justice, and the plague was stopped. It's an interesting choice of words here, and we got to explain. Vayamod Pinchas Vaipalel Vateatzer Hamagefa. It's translated as ex executed justice, but okay, let's better understand this word. The root of this word can also be found in the word tefillah, prayer. Lehit Palel, Animit Palel, I am praying. So Vaipalel, Vait Palel, you see there, it's, it's essentially the same word. And there's another place in the Torah where, again, I, I already know this because I know this verse. There are other places, but one the one that came to mind was from Genesis 48, 11. This is when Jacob was about to bless, uh, was blessing Joseph on his deathbed, and he was about to bless his uh, grandchildren. He says, who are these? These are mine. God gave them to me. And then he answers this. And Israel said to Joseph, Genesis 48, 11, and Israel said to Joseph, I had not expected to see even your face. And behold, God has shown me your children too, your offspring. So listen to the wording in Hebrew. Vayomer Israel, Israel said, El Yosef, to Joseph. Reo panecha, reo, re'e, to see panecha, your face. Lo pilalti. Pinchas vayipalel. Lo pilalti. So it's not, there's no, there's no, um, Lo hit palalti. There's not the first taf of tefillah. So in other words, it's essentially the same word. Here is expected. That's how they, it's translated. So let's get a better understanding from what and how Pinchas did by understanding the words of Jacob. You always have to go to the, the point of origin and then from there take it what it actually means. Look what Rashi says regarding the word lo pilalti, where it says, I, I did not expect. Lo mela'ani libi lachshov machshava she'ere'e panecha od. I had not expected, meaning, lo pilalti, meaning I did not even allow my heart or mind to perceive the possibility that I would ever see your face again. And now behold, I see your children as well. Boom. That's why, I mean, this verse always stood out to me. It was such a like, he did not even allow his heart, because when we read about Jacob, he says, Jacob refused to be comforted, right? He did not want to be comforted. Okay, then it says, Pilalti lashon machshava, meaning the thought, the focus. So when, so that's the, that's essentially the meaning of this word. So when we read again, Psalms 106.30, Vayamod pinchas vayipalel vata'atzer amargifa, pinchas stood up and executed justice and the plague was stopped. What is translated as executed justice may have been what he was focused on while he was praying. So indeed he was praying, but it was his focus while he was praying. You see, we could read Psalms when someone says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pray. In, in the Jewish world today, and again, I say that this is unfortunate. This is, um, just so you understand, okay, in the Gentile word, a world when you say go pray heavenly father you know creator of the world and so on and so forth you're going to start speaking with your own words this is how everyone used to play up on uh, to pray up until the time of the second temple <clears throat> the three prayers were incorporated by Ezra and Nehemiah and that's what we have today these are very, very wise prayers because they cover everything and they're filled with verses from the Torah and with Psalms but at no point does that take away from our ability to pray directly to God in our own words? These prayers are mandatory for Jews. But what? When I say, okay, I got to go pray to God, I don't necessarily open up a book of Tehillim. And when I do, guess what? There's a, a specific focus. But the best prayers that I have, obviously, is when I use my own words. Still, in addition to what I'm required as a Jew to do. Okay? So when, like we said, when we read Psalms, Go through the davening in the city. We're reading the words. These are not other people. These are the words of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the words of Joseph, of Moses, of David. These are holy words that we're reading. 
and they have gravity, yes? They, they, they mean something, they can shake the heavens. But while we're saying their words, what are we focused on? That is the meaning of this word. There always has to be a singular focus to make the difference. Okay, so for instance, if someone is someone is sick, there are specific psalms. We have it in the psalm books. I don't know if it's in your psalm books, but in all this, and maybe in art scroll, they have it too. In all the psalms, it says next to the psalm what this psalm is for. This psalm is to heal people uh, for, for a sick person. This psalm is uh, for uh, Parnassa, for livelihood. This psalm is uh, to save you from, uh, to help you out from a stressful situation. Every psalm has something else, and you'll also understand it from the words. David was in this. In that situation, all the Psalms were an experience of his life. Based on what he was going through, tapping into that energy through Ruach HaKodesh, which we know David was like number one, or actually number two next to Moses. It was taken from, from the heavens, put it down over there. And so when we read his words that are relevant to the Psalm, depending on the situation that we're on, we focus according to that, right? So it's already an assen essentially done for us. But how many times can we not even express privately what we feel and what's going on to our maker? Sometimes I come in here, this, this is also my office. If sometimes I feel, you know, you get those feelings, you're like, honey, I just, I, I need some time. You come in, I close the door. I either sit right here in this chair or I fall right here on the floor on my face and nothing comes out. But I, it's like a silent cry. It's like my mouth is open, like, but nothing comes out. That's okay too. You understand? So this is the meaning. <laughs> this is the meaning of that word. There's a lot. There's a lot going on there. And that, and by the way, that also counts because sometimes we don't even have the words. Sometimes we can't come up with the words. But our neshama, our soul, feels the need to scream, and it's okay. God understands what it is that you're trying to say. But it always helps to have a specific focus because it's like. Well, what do you want? You know, tell me what you want. In, invoke your right as my son. You have the words over here. What do you want? What can I do? Tell me. And we see this always, this back and forth between, let's say, God and Abraham and God and Moses. It's a negotiation. God's like, I'm going to take them out. Moses is like, but if you do that, what are the nations going to say? They're going to say that, you know, the, this God uh, uh, starts something, but he doesn't finish it. And how did he discard his people? Okay, you got a good point. Another time, but you already gave your word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can't break your word to them. He's like, fine. And we see again in Deuteronomy how many times, not because of you did I take you out of the land of Egypt, because I swore to your forefathers. That's why I did it. So it's good to know the terms and conditions and to bring it back to God. That's why he gave us these terms and conditions. I think I'm going off on a tangent. Let's just get back. Anyway, it's important. So when Pinchas prayed, he was focused first and foremost on God's honor. It wasn't about himself. He wasn't asking God for anything. It was all about God. And everything he did was for God's namesake. He already proved it by his choice of action. So first he did the deed. And then after he did the deed, then he asked. And that's something that I just, again, it, it, was, it was brought to me again last week. Check this out. <clears throat> Here's a secret of what to get, uh, of to get what you want. Um, I mean, again, assuming it is allowed, yes? When you pray to God, in order to get that kind of attention, you do a good deed. You do a mitzvah, but not an easy mitzvah. I'm not just taking, okay, take a shekel and put it in the tzedakah box and say, hey, God, I just did that. Do this for me now. We're talking about a situation that God will put before you, something that you really have to go out of your way to do, something that is annoying to you, frustrating, might mess up your day, but you do it anyway. God just did that. For you, he gave you that opportunity, and that's huge. Why? Because when you're done with that, that's when you come to God. Not, hey, I just did that for you. That's when you ask God humbly, thank you for giving me that situation. Thank you for taking me out of my day. I now humbly come before you, and I need help. Please help me with ABC. I need to pay rent. I need school for the kids. I need uh, I need Parnassa. I uh, you know health for this or that or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. The point is is that 
if you already did something so selfless that you know is selfless, again, like Pinchas, he put his life on the line. Straight up. He could have been killed. They were actually coming to kill him. When you go out of your way, not for your own sake, not even thinking, well, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go ask from God. That's not how that works. God is not a vending machine, right? But if you do this wholeheartedly and you understand that God gave you that opportunity, then you can come before him. And that is when your prayers are heard because you already did the deed. You earned your right. You just bought your ticket right there. Think about that. Wait for the next opportunity. This is not an opportunity you can create for yourself. That's the other thing. This is an opportunity that God cr creates for you, gives to you, if you are worthy. Okay? All right. So just keep that in mind. Free tip. Let's go. So, naturally, Pinchas, he thought about Israel, who carry God's name as well, meaning they're one and the same. Right? God can't destroy Israel because Israel, that's God's name. This is how Moses prayed to God. Consider your promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, Israel, right? That would, what would the nation say? I said that, but yeah, I'm saying here again, write it down. Okay, what would the nation say if you destroyed us or you broke your word and so on? We have the ammunition. We already have the preventative measures. God already gave them to us for troubles to come. Like it says in Masecha Megillah 13b, God never hits Israel without always giving them the remedy before the blow. We always have it. So no matter what comes, we also know exactly how to get out of it. We have it. We just have to do it. There's always a way back. We just need to know what medicine to take for which instance. In this case, Pinchas knew what it was. But there's another word hiding within this word, vaipalel, and that is the word pelili, which means criminal. Remember that. We'll get to it. So let's go back to the third part of the priestly offering from our topic in Sanhedrin. The belly is as its plain meaning, as its plain meaning. In the verses described in the incident, and it likewise states, and he thrust both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly, so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Numbers 25, 8. As a result of his actions, right, by Pinchas, who essentially brought justice to the world, redeemed God's namesake and saved Israel, all within one true thrust of the halberd, as our text says, he emerged and rose as a mighty halachic leader and judge in Israel. Dayan veshofet gadol beYisrael. Okay, Dayan is even higher than a judge. There are judges. Dayan is like he tells the judges what to do. He's the one that um, that imposes the law. So, what is the true job of a judge from Israel? Not like a worldly judge. You commit a crime, you do the time in hopes that the convict is now reformed and becomes a useful and positive member of society afterwards, right? But let's be real. In most cases, this is not how it works. Often men are thrown in prison far, uh, for far smaller things, and they get put in a worse environment, in the, the, the worst environments in the world, and that's your idea of reform. It's kind of destroying society. The current system takes people who made mistakes and turns them into monsters by locking them up with real monsters. And then those poor people, they become monsters themselves and the cycle just continues. The job of an Israelite judge is the same job as any Jew. And that is to repent, repair that which has been damaged, correct ourselves and become better than we ever have been before the fall. That is the purpose of the fall. Yerida letzorech aliyah, the descent for the purpose of ascending. Let's say if we were on a five and we fell to a two, going back to a five means failure for a Jew. Totally rhymed. God expects more of us, and rightfully so. So if we fall from a five to a two, and then we go up to a six, a seven, an eight, steadily rising, becoming better and better, that is judgment, and that is justice well served. As a result of Pinchas's actions, 
The men of Israel saw what they did. The ones who were about to be strung up, they saw what they did and they all did complete tshuva. So not even the men who sinned would have been killed. These men who got their lives back by the mercy of God will go on to inspire others to do good. They will raise their children in a way that teaches them to love and honor God and to show kindness to one another the way God showed kindness to them, though they had it coming, but it doesn't matter. Do you understand? These now, these people now have that zealousy of Pinchas, that zeal of Pinchas, because of God having mercy upon them. So again, when we read in Psalms 106.30, Pinchas stood up and Vaipalel focused on the ju executed justice, whatever, and the plague was stopped. Where was he standing? Our text gives us another verse from Exodus 21.22. And should men quarrel and hit a pregnant woman and she miscarries, but there is no fatality, meaning the mother doesn't die, but the child does, right? He shall surely be punished when the woman's husband makes demands of him. Mm, you better believe it. And he shall give restitution according to the judge's orders. What does it say in Hebrew? Um, Punish, he will be punished. This is a double punishment. Same word, different variation. Biflilim conveniently translates as, and he shall give restitution according to the judge's orders. Okay, question. What would you do to a man who kicked your pregnant wife and she lost the baby? I know, of course, right? You might very well beat that guy to within an inch of his life, if not kill him, right? That's the first, uh, me too. First thing, no question beyond a shadow of a doubt, okay? Because he damaged your family. He brought death to your family. In the world today, people are not punished for sleeping around, living that life, The again, that, that's how it this what's going on in the world today because it's considered <clears throat> it's considered standard living and regrettably and like I said this publicly plenty of times this is also how I used to live but if you are part of Israel you cannot just live as the world does you cannot just go sleeping around you cannot take foreign women you're not allowed to marry anybody who's not uh, who's not a Jew and you cannot succumb to idolatry because of foreign women, thereby forsaking your God. So many Jews today, they marry non-Jewish women. That's it. Bye-bye, God. No problem. And they live that life. This is essentially the same thing that happened over here. The same one who took you out of the land of Egypt to be your God, that's the one you're going to turn your back on right now. But the men in question did all of that, sexual immorality and idolatry. This is what you call a felony. And these men... They are all criminals. Now look what our, what our text goes on to say. And he, Pinchas, who he would beat the young men of Israel. Oh yes, he would beat them. And drag them throughout the entire camp of Israel that all the people should see them and fear. So again, not only did everybody in the camp see the, the two shish kebab people on the spike, but also he would beat the, the young men of Israel who partook in all the shenanigans from Parshat, uh, the end of Balak and the beginning of Pinchas. This is what we call a good old-fashioned public shaming. No, they didn't get cabbage thrown at them. I don't know where so many vegetables are coming in these movies, right? Yeah, cabbage and rotten vegetables. Nor did they get booed. No, but these young men had to look into the eyes of their brethren as their despicable acts were made known. Not just that they did them, but they damaged all of Israel as a result. They put everyone in danger and Israel was on the brink of complete annihilation. And again, they have to go through the camp while they're be being beaten by Pinchas and they have to look in the eyes of all the people that know what they didn't. Wait a minute, because of this guy, we would have all been wiped out. First of all, how could you do something like that? Second of all, 
because of what you did, we almost all of this was would be reversed. This whole thing would have been ended. Think about th those individuals going through that publicly. Okay. The shame they must have felt. I'm sure they would have preferred death at that point. But the, that, that shame, when one feels shame like that, it brings a man to his knees and causes the type of regret that cannot be achieved in any other way. And this too, I know from personal experience. Listen to my story. Now we have to remember that everything that we have done be it in public or in private, when we thought that no one was looking, will be taken into account. You have to understand this. On the great day of judgment, the entire universe will know everything that you have done, and we will then have to stand there wishing we were anywhere else. As said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13, 14, the end of the matter what, what is the end of everything? Everything having been heard, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the entire man. That is your purpose. If you are a Jew, you have 613. If you are a Noahide, you got seven. That's it. Do your job. For every deed God will bring to judgment, for every hidden thing, whether good or bad, even in private, in your most private and personal moments, everything. So you see, when one feels shame for what they did, that means they regret what they did. Now, I'm not talking about regretting something because you got caught. Not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding the magnitude of your actions and the ripples they cause throughout the realms. These young men of Israel, all of them did tshuva, perfect tshuva. And that is what Pinchas did. That was the greatness of what he did. He stood amongst the felons, amongst the criminals, and he found a way to appease both God and man without causing any further bloodshed, without causing God to lose any more of his firstborn son, Israel. And for that reason, our text continues and says, the Holy One, blessed be he, saw, that Pin saw what Pinchas did, not only in the physical world, obviously, but in uh, but its uh, reverse effects throughout the spiritual world. And he stopped the plague that was upon Israel. As said in the verse, Pinchas stood up and executed justice, and the plague was stopped. What would be our takeaway from this teaching? Is it the life-saving, world-saving actions of Pinchas? Is it the shame and correction that the young men of Israel had to go through? Or is it the long-suffering mercies of God? If you had to wrap them all in one, it would be obviously the long-suffering mercies of God. Because if there's God's not long-suffering, none of these things are even happening. They're not relevant. We're dead. End of story. Erechapayim, God is long-suffering. Specifically. That is the beginning, and that that is the beginning, and that is the end. But if we do nothing on our end, right? If we don't initiate it from here to move towards God's mercy, why then would God come towards us? You see, people think, oh, it's already done for me. No, no, you have to make the effort. Everything that was created in this world, this entire world, is olam ha As we see in the end of Genesis, asher ba'aloim la'asot, which God created to do. All of creation is to do. This is the world of action. Okay, so if we're not willing to repent and correct, taking whatever is coming to us, again, punishments need to be need to uh, need to take place. These punishments, these are corrections then why would we expect to keep on living the way that we do without repercussions? You can't keep living the way you do and say, oh, why is God like this or like that to me? You're doing this to you. God's not doing this. God's like, what are you waiting for? Stop it. Just stop it. Just stop it. Stop it. Why are you hitting yourself? So I'm going to read you a passage <clears throat> from a book called Zera Kodesh, which just so happens to come from our last Parsha. That's why I'm tying it into this now. It says, and behold, the blessed one, uh, the blessed one has told us, as God had told us, if you make an opening, an opening for me the size of a needle point, 
it will widen to the size of a banquet hall, right? This is in regards to the desire to do tshuva. Just show the tiniest, teeny tiniest desire to show tshuva, to do tshuva. In other words, genuinely. And just, eh, just that little, the size of a needle, God will open that to the size of a banquet hall. And they're not the size of the banquet halls like we have here. We're talking about God's banquet halls. That is infinity, people. Okay? If you make an opening for me the size of a needle point, I will widen it to the size of a banquet hall. This is in regard to the desire to do tshuva and is derived from Song of Songs 5.2 that says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Hark, my beloved is knocking. Open for me. Pitchili, this is that opening that we were talking about. And also in Malachi 3, 7, from the days of your fathers, you have departed from my laws and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. First, you return to me and then I will return to you. I'm not going to chase after you. I'm not going anywhere. You guys are the ones that went away. So return to me and then I will return to you, said the Lord of hosts, that you said with what have we to return? The, here's the excuses. Oh, I don't have time. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm tired. I'm this. Da, da, da. These are excuses. It's not doing anything. It's not changing. And then you get frustrated why your situation is not changing. You got to change it. It's all on you. There are no freebies. There are no handouts here. That's a different religion like we discussed. The aspect of tshuva is in the way of returning that which was stolen. This is what Shuva is from Leviticus 5.23. And it shall be when he has sinned and is guilty that he shall return the article which he had robbed or the funds which he had withheld or the item this, that, um, which had been dep uh, deposited with him or the article which he had found. Is to, this is to return what was lost, right? Because when we sin, we cause holy sparks to fall into the klipot, but through tshuva, they are all returned to their rightful place. But wait. And so according to this, and this is what he asks, why should a man receive a reward greater than one he has not sinned or in... Sorry. Why should a man receive a reward greater than one, uh, than one who has not sinned or is completely righteous? You understand the question? Question is, you got a guy who did not sin and you have a, a guy who did who did sin, but made complete tshuva and came back. Why is the sinner coming back, no longer a sinner, obviously, why is he considered then on a higher level than he who did not sin to begin with? And so according to this, right, um, that their sins should be considered, um, why, is, why is their sins considered as positives? A man did nothing more than return what he had stolen. Why should he be rewarded? This doesn't work in the world, now does it, right? You steal something, you give it back, you still got uh, repercussions. You still might go to prison. Even if not, you're not going to receive a gold star for doing what is right, okay, after or righting your wrong. But we're talking about in God's world, according to the Torah, and the way things really work beyond the veil. And that is when a man sins, and corrects that sin through tshuva. God considers it, get this, it is as if that man had created something new. God creates new things, and we create new things. That's it. And when a person does tshuva, corrects that sin through tshuva, it is as if he created something new, new, that did not exist before. Psalms one, uh, Psalm 62, 13 says, and you, O oh Lord, have kindness, for you repay a man according to his deeds. Here's your action. Kemasehu. Not according to his feelings, not according to his intentions, not even according to his thoughts. God knows my heart. Or, yeah, I'm a spiritual person. I have a relationship with God, but I do whatever I want to do because whatever. No, that's clear. That doesn't apply to you. The Torah is clearly not talking about any of that. But this means that when a man sins, and we all do, no matter how badly he sins, and we all do, no matter how long he, uh, low he may have sunk, and we all do, 
no matter how many dark and destructive angels were created from those choices that not only damage the individual, but his surroundings and the world at large. Everything counts, remember? <coughs> Should this man take responsibility? Should he feel remorse and repent and spend his life not only correcting what he did, but help others not to fall or even a more difficult task? helping others who fell to get back up. Then those dark angels, which the man himself created, because they didn't exist before, now become angels of light, good angels, advocates instead of accusers, bettering not only himself, but his surroundings and the world at large. This man just created something new. Do you understand? This man just did something that by default, one who had not sinned in such a way, has not created. He paid his dues, and should he choose to return to God, as the verse states, God will return to him. We are still in the month of Elul, people, and the king is in the field. Freebies for all now when you have the ear. Now's that time. Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment for all mankind. And we have two weeks before we have to stand. Use this time given to examine yourselves so you can come clean before God with advocates and not adversaries. We are all criminals, and we're, or we were at one point or another. And thank God that we have his system in play. That actually gives us a fighting chance. All we need is that fighting chance. But the work always has to start with us. It always starts down here. And no one else can do this for you. As David said, who was the master of tshuva, in Psalm 62, 13, oh you, and you, O oh Lord, have kindness that is chesed, for you repay a man according to his deeds. So thank you all for joining me. Um, if you have any questions, please send me an email, okay? If you write all these questions in the comments, I, it's hard for me to take it seriously because then it just starts a string and I, I regret even commenting there. Please, if you have legitimate questions, send me an email. I will answer you. I'd be happy to, okay? So have a wonderful rest of the week and have a Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.